are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is one that was solved after 20 years. This is the Eastburn family murders, a case that involves three different trials, an immediate prime suspect, and multiple witnesses, yet it took two decades to completely solve. The survivors weren't able to help much with the investigation, but it turned out they might have been being followed by the killer for years afterwards. By the way, if you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if it's something you'd like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up and leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1985 in North Carolina, and the Eastburn family lived in Fayetteville. They actually lived at 367 Summer Hill Road. This was Catherine, who went by Katie and Gary, and their three little girls who were Kara, Aaron, and Jana. And they were five, three, and almost two years old. So they were all still very young. Like I said, Catherine went by Katie, and she had actually met Gary 15 years prior. Now, as cliche as it sounds, they actually believed it was love at first sight when they saw one another. They met at a softball game in Kansas where Katie grew up and they kept going out on little dates, going to softball games together until they knew that they were meant to be and they married. Now they did wait five years of dating so this wasn't just a jump into a relationship and get married like some people do. They did do the whole dating for quite a long period of time before having those precious little girls who were everything to them. Now, Gary was actually a captain in the United States Air Force and Katie stayed home to take care of the girls who were quite a handful and their dog. Now, Katie was a really good mother. She was thought to be very patient, very kind, and she made sure that her girls had everything that they wanted and needed. Gary was often working, but when he was home, he was such a good dad. Kara was actually daddy's little girl and would follow him everywhere like a shadow when he was home. Now in 1983, Gary was sent to Fayetteville by the Air Force to serve as the Chief of Air Traffic Control. They said there, but they knew as a military family there was a good chance that they would be moving again. Yet two years later, they were still in town. The neighbors absolutely loved them, so did everyone around town. They were well known and for good things. The girls were really thriving there, and the Eastburns were loving it in Fayetteville. However, they were planning to move to England because Gary had gotten a job with the Royal Air Force. Now, they were packing, they were looking to sell their home, they were, you know, doing all the little things that they needed to do. They were also getting a new home for their English settler named Dixie, their little dog, because they wanted her to have a more stable home and they were going to be moving so often and they just couldn't bring her with. But on May 12th of 1985, the Fayetteville police were called to 367 Summer Hill Road that afternoon and the neighbors of the Eastburn family who were Bob and Jeanette Seafelt were kind of close friends of theirs. They talked to them often. They knew about the girls. They were, you know, very good neighbors to them. They weren't super close, but they were neighborly and they hadn't seen them in a few days and they had started to get worried. When the neighbors got closer to the home, they noticed that their newspapers were kind of piling up on their porch and normally the Eastburns would go out and grab the newspaper, bring it in. They never really piled it up. So they did ring the doorbell and that is when Bob heard a baby crying and asked his wife, Janet, to come over and see if she heard the same thing. And they were certain that it was baby Jana crying. They immediately phoned the police and an investigator arrived around 15 minutes later, but unfortunately no cries could be heard and the investigator was confused thinking maybe they had heard something or were mistaken. And the investigator also couldn't do anything until backup arrived. But at the same time, the Eastburn's babysitter, who was a woman named Ju 
newly arrived after also being called by the neighbors because the neighbors didn't really, I believe, even have their phone number. And so they knew the babysitter's phone number and called her. She was, you know, a well-known babysitter around town, kind of more of like a teenager, young adult who would babysit for a lot of different couples. She was very well trusted and she arrived there and she could see this baby through the window and she said that is Jana we need to get in there and get her she looks frantic and I can tell something is wrong so they immediately started cutting the screen of the door and going inside once inside they found Jana the almost two-year-old baby crying in her crib she looked miserable pale sweaty she was covered in her own bodily fluids and the neighbor actually was told by investigators to take the baby girl out of the home and to get her some food some water and so investigators could search the rest of the home. And so Janet and Bob took this baby into their home, gave her a clean shirt, and she was also given milk. And they could tell just by how fast Janet was drinking that milk that she was severely dehydrated. She ended up choking on it and then throwing up because she was trying to drink it so fast. Meanwhile, investigators had found her family. In the master bedroom, they began to find the decomposing bodies. Now, three-year-old Erin was found on the floor next to the master bed. She had a pillow over her face and her throat had been cut so deep that she was almost decapitated. Her 32-year-old mother was actually found with her throat cut and her underwear cut off of her as well and she was on the other side of the bed I believe on the floor. She was stabbed 15 times in the chest and had also been sexually assaulted. As far as five-year-old Kara, she was found in her own bedroom hiding under her Star Wars blanket and she had also been stabbed to death. The surviving baby Jana was taken to the hospital to be checked on and they found that she was only hours away from death by dehydration. This baby girl almost didn't survive, yet she appeared not to be touched by this killer at all. Yet two of her sisters were and investigators found that this was the hardest part of the entire crime scene, seeing their little bodies. Now, Julie, the girl's babysitter, was questioned, and she said the last time she saw the Eastburn family, including Katie, was that Wednesday prior, and she went with all of them to the fair because Katie was worried that she wouldn't be able to handle all three girls on her own, wanted to make sure they were all safe, so she asked Julie to come with. She wasn't necessarily going as a babysitter, more kind of like a friend that was just helping out, but neighbors, Bob and Janet, who had come over, they had said that they had last seen Katie and the girls that Thursday, so a day after that, kind of in the earlier morning. But Julie, the babysitter, said that Katie was getting very strange phone calls. These were recent, but she didn't know if this had anything to do with the murders. They had allegedly been saying that Katie was pretty, what a pretty woman she was, and sometimes they said nothing at all. And so it was very creepy, and Katie had also mentioned she believed she may have a stalker. You know, like I said, no one has any right to be killed in the first place, but I mean, especially this woman, she's just too nice of a woman, you know. How long have you known them? I've known them uh, approximately a year. You babysitting that long? Uh, no, not, well, yeah, I guess. I've been, maybe. Julie. Maybe eight months. Get an idea who would do this? Well, she was getting some strange phone calls that she. Julie, don't be giving no ideas who did something. You I ain't giving that. no ideas about. Will you just look? No, I'm telling him what he wants to know. Idea. You don't know nothing. He says, "Do you have any idea?" Yeah. I'm telling him what I think. Quit it right now. to the fair Wednesday, this past Wednesday. Her and her three kids. She wanted me to come with her because she didn't think she'd be able to manage all three of them, you know. How old are you? By herself. One was, I think, 18 months, one was five, and one was three. 
and neighbors were completely shocked. People all over the neighborhood were gathering around to try to see what was going on. Many were interviewed by reporters, which I will include here if I can. Uh, this has got to be a macabre tragedy that you discovered on Mother's Day. Uh, what's, what's this first, have you ever had anything like this happen before in your neighborhood? No, nothing, no, nothing like this at all. It's a dream. It's hard to, you can't imagine something like this. How would you describe the family that lived next door to you? What kind of people were they? I, uh, close-knit family, uh, military family. Uh, I never heard her raise her voice. I never heard him raise his voice at the children at any time, even though they got away with murder. They never, they never did anything. What is a bad word to use. This has got to come as a shock to the neighborhood. This is normally a quiet neighborhood. Yeah, I found out there, there have been a few robberies in the neighborhood in the last few years, but, you know, nothing nowhere near like this. This has been a quiet neighborhood. It's been a good neighborhood. Uh, you see young, you see teenagers walking up and down the street 10, 11 o'clock at night, but I guess that's going to stop. As the news spread, many wondered, where was their father and husband? Did he have anything to do with this? Well, at the time, Gary Eastburn was on a flight home that Mother's Day evening, because what I didn't tell you is that the day that they were found was actually Mother's Day. Now, he was headed from the airport straight to the Fayetteville Police Department. You see, Gary was undergoing training at an officer's school in Alabama. Now, this was since earlier that year, so that he had been there for quite a few months, around four to five by this point. But he had gotten a call that day that there had been a death in the family and he needed to return home immediately. But surprisingly enough, when Gary first heard this and saw that he was speaking to a police officer, he was the one to bring up death first. He actually asked him how many of them were dead. This seems strange, and the officer wouldn't tell him more, only to come home. That's exactly what Gary did, because even before he answered that phone, he knew something was wrong, because he had been trying to call Katie for days and had heard nothing. Gary and Katie spent quite a bit of time apart just due to Gary's job, but they were always in contact. They wrote letters back and forth constantly, and so they even had a certain day that they would call each other and they never missed that day. To keep their relationship alive, this is what they did. Gary didn't want to be far from his wife and his kids who he loved, so this is how he kind of dealt with the problem and how it worked for them. But on Saturday, May 11th, the day before, Gary had called Katie and she never picked up. This was not like her. They had the phone schedule every week and so he waited and he waited and as hours passed, Gary decided to call again and that evening he still heard nothing from his family. Knowing something was wrong, he called a friend who was friends with a police officer in the Fayetteville area. This friend told the deputy about Gary's concerns and the deputy ended up going to the Eastburn residence just to have a look around. By this point, it was pretty late, but he did knock on the door. He got no answer. He canvassed the area and saw nothing out of the ordinary, so he decided to go next door to a neighbor. Like I said, it was pretty late. So when he knocked on the neighbor's door, he woke the neighbor up and he asked if anything Thing. seemed odd if he had noticed anything and this man was very annoyed this was Bob Seafelt that we talked about before and he was very annoyed he was being questioned so late he didn't know what was going on he said the family had spoken about possibly going to see Gary where he was in Alabama and that is where he assumed they had gone now this would be the same neighbor that the next morning decided he wanted to make sure that there wasn't something more going on because the deputy had just gone home that night. He had left a note under the Eastburn door to get back to him, but he decided to go home because there was nothing pointed to anything going wrong. But Bob decided the next morning that something may have been wrong and that he was possibly mistaken. So he had gone over there and that's when he heard the baby crying. The Summer Hill Road house had become a crime scene and the locks and latches on all of the doors and windows appeared to be unlocked and the living room appeared to be where a struggle had occurred. Evidence was being collected in every room, luminol tests were being done all about the house and on the walls and it appeared as though someone did try to clean up the crime scene. There was still blood all over but not as much as there should have been, especially in the master bedroom. Fingerprints and hair were found, and this was hair of the head and of the pubic region, and 
There was also semen found in Katie's body. Bloody fingerprints were found as well as shoe prints. There was also bloodied towels and there were shoe prints found inside and outside of the home. When Gary arrived back in Fayetteville, he talked to investigators. He was also brought to the home after the bodies of his family members were taken away and he was asked to identify any remains that appeared to be stolen. Investigators wanted to see if robbery could have been the motive here and Gary found that a metal lock box and an envelope of around $300 in cash had been been taken as well as Katie's ATM card and a little slip of paper that was the password to her ATM card. Yet it still didn't make sense as to why these two little girls would have been brutally murdered as well. They were only five and three and investigators thought maybe this killer thought that they would identify him but thankfully they wouldn't have to theorize everything because there was witnesses. Now, while Jenna was alive, she is not the witness that I'm talking about. You see, she was only two years old. It took her a month to recover from her dehydration and nearing the point of death. And after that, Jenna was actually in the care of her father, who was also grieving the loss of his wife and girls. And he was also so relieved that she was alive too. And he, she really kept him going, but she was also going to see a child psychologist, not just to deal with the trauma, but also to talk about the murders and what she may have witnessed. Of course, this was done in a way that a two-year-old could handle, but while talking to the toddler, the psychologist would bring up things like asking Jana if the house that she lived in was scary or if anything happened while in the house. Now, the little girl would say things like it was scary and would tell her to shh and would say someone was inside the house. She mentioned hiding, being scared that someone would get her. She said, hide from the burglar so he doesn't get us and he's going to come get me. But as far as who she was afraid of, Jana couldn't say. Now, the psychologist believed that maybe her sisters had actually come into her bedroom, told her what was going on, that she needed to hide and be quiet because someone was in the home. And that is what Jana was repeating and that the killer actually didn't even know she was there because she was being very quiet and hiding from him. When shown pictures of her mother, Katie, Jana would actually kiss the picture and say that that was her mommy. Now, investigators didn't want to cause Jana any more trauma and they believed that she wouldn't be able to tell them about the killer anyway. She was just too young and probably didn't see much. But this wouldn't be their only hope because investigators had come across a man while they were discovering the bodies. That same night, a man named Patrick Cohn wanted to talk to investigators and he claimed that he had seen a tall white man with blonde hair, a mustache, a large flared nose, and he was wearing jeans, a knit cap, and a black members only jacket. He was also leaving that very driveway of the Eastburn home around 3.30 a.m. Friday morning. This was on May 10th, two days prior to them being found. Patrick said that the guy actually spoke to him and said that he was getting an early morning start. He then got into a white Chevrolet Chevette and drove away. Patrick was brought down to the station. He worked on a sketch with investigators and this was a picture that was going to be shown to the media. Due to this witness statement, investigators believe they finally had a timeline for the murders. Neighbors had seen them early Thursday, May 9th, and this man was seen leaving their home around 3 a.m. on May 10th. So they theorized that that Thursday evening into the early hours of Friday morning is when they were murdered. Patrick was a janitor who was said to be out that early morning because he was going home from his girlfriend's house. The problem was he did have a criminal record which did cast doubt on his statement, but by this point, investigators had also tracked down where Katie's ATM card was used and they found that it had been used twice after the murders. This was Saturday night and Sunday morning and $300 had been spent. Another witness came forward at this point when the news came out about this ATM card and said that that Sunday morning she had seen a tall blonde man taking money out right before her. She said that the description looked just like what Patrick had said. She'd actually been tracked down as the person to use the ATM machine right after whoever had done this did. 
when they used Katie's card. Now they had a description of the car and the man, but this was going to be the most difficult part, finding him. Or so they thought. You see, a man would come down to the Cumberland County Sheriff's Office on May 15th, three days after the bodies were discovered. Detective Robert Biddle and Jack Watts brought him into the interrogation room where he was questioned. He said he was the man they were looking for. However, he didn't mean he was the killer. You see, the Eastburn's babysitter had given investigators another strong lead. Julie had said that just a few days before the murder, Katie had put an ad in the newspaper about rehoming her dog, Dixie. Julie said that she had answered a phone call from a woman named Angela who said she was interested, and Julie left her information on a note for Katie to get back to her. Investigators went and looked for this note and found that it was nowhere inside the home and the dog was no longer there either. Investigators went to the media and pleaded for the new dog owners to come forward, thinking they may have known something. This man had been sent to the police station by his wife, Angela, and he told them that he had seen Katie and the girls that Tuesday before the murder, so May 7th, way before the timeline had even been constructed, you know, going back into the Eastburn's history. The last we knew about was on Thursday. So this was on Tuesday that he said he had seen the family and picked up their dog. Investigators wanted to know more and the man said he took the dog and then two days later on Thursday, May 9th, he had called Katie and they were just kind of talking about how Dixie was settling into her new home. That night, which was theorized to be the night of the murders, this man didn't have an alibi. Now, he said he drove his wife and daughter to his in-laws and gassed up his car before going home alone, meaning no one knew where he was. But this man was also willing to give blood, hair, fingerprints, and saliva for them to test as well. He appeared to be cooperative. And so they really didn't have any reason to look at him any further, except for the fact that he was identical to the sketch that Patrick Cohn had created. Investigators thought it was far too similar to be a coincidence. Investigators also found that Katie had written a letter to Gary saying that she had met with a man who was going to adopt Dixie and that he was very nice. But they knew that testing would take some time even though they collected everything from this man. And for some of the tests, such as the sperm sample, there were no tests to be done at this time in 1985. This man was being interrogated as a possible killer and he began to realize that. So he was asking if he needed to contact a lawyer. They told him no, they were just asking a few questions, but they also didn't have anything to hold this man on. So after seven hours, he went home. But that's when they noticed he was driving a white Chevrolet Chevette. And that's when they decided to bring witness Patrick Cohn in for a photo lineup that included this man. Patrick allegedly picked out this man as soon as he saw him as the man that he saw that night. However, some news sources do say that he hesitated at first and wasn't sure. But regardless, this led to the arrest of Timothy D. Hennis at his own home. It turned out he hadn't told the full truth either. You see, his ex-girlfriend went to investigators to inform them that that Friday night after he said he'd just gone home, Timothy had come to visit her. Remember, he was a married man, but he had just randomly shown up and she sent him away. This wouldn't be the only person who would come forward with strange information about Timothy either. A neighbor of his claimed that his family was normally quiet and nice, but on Saturday, they noticed something strange. Timothy was out back near his barrel burning something and the Hennis family was said to never do anything like this. They didn't burn anything. He wasn't doing yard work and neighbors immediately noticed something was off. They couldn't tell what was burning, but they did contact police when they heard that that same neighbor was being looked at for a triple homicide. You told me that y'all were out in the yard Saturday and you saw him burning some stuff. What did right. you see him burning? It, he took the trash can from the corner in the yard down there and brought it up to the house and he had flames going all the way up to the roof there. We don't know what he burned, but it was unusual because he didn't rake the yard or anything. He just cut the grass. Didn't look like it was trash he was burning. No, I don't know what it was, but it was something he burned. How would you describe him? I mean, was he a nice guy, quiet guy? Or? I only talked to him on the fence one time, he was nice. Does this come as a shock to y'all? Yeah. You knew him? Yeah, I knew him. What kind of guy was he? All right guy to me. Never no problem. 
talk a lot. Uh, I knew him very, very good. Did he ever give any indication that he was capable of what he's charged with? No, not to me. He never did. How would you describe him? I mean, what kind of guy was it? Easy going guy. He was uh, always out here working on his yard or playing with his dog, helping me with my car whenever I asked him to. But this wasn't all. A local dry cleaner claimed that Timothy had been to his store and dropped off a jacket on Friday. This was none other than a black members only jacket that Patrick had described. But remember when investigators first thought that the motive could have been a robbery gone wrong? Well, it turns out Timothy would have had a reason to steal money because his landlord came forward saying that Timothy owed him $300 for that month's rent. He hadn't paid it, he was late, but then right after the murders, he paid in full $300. Investigators believed they had their guy and so they went to pick Timothy up. He didn't cause a scene, he went without a fight. However, when his face was being, you know, attacked with cameras and paparazzi and reporters when he got down to the police station, he basically like cowered over and was trying to hide his face from being shown. He bowed his head and all the while he claimed he had nothing to do with the murders and that they would know for sure if they just tested the evidence found in the home against him. But Timothy Hennis was a husband and a father to a newborn girl. He had been born on February 24th in 1958 in Minnesota. He joined the army when he was 22 and shortly after got married to Angela. By the time he was 27, they had a baby girl named Christina and that same year, two little girls and their mother would be murdered. And now he was the prime suspect. He had been working at Fort Bragg as a parachute rigger at the time. It was a master sergeant. Everyone who knew him said that he was always doing his best. He was a nice guy. He would help out neighbors. He had friends. He was protective over his family and he never had problems at work. When the tests finally came back, they were inconclusive. You see, there had only been partial fingerprints and the blood was mostly found to belong to the victims. Nothing, including the hair strands that were found, were concrete enough to match to Timothy or a killer in general, yet Timothy was still their prime suspect. He was booked and his trial was set for the next year and his wife and daughter continued to be by his side and visit him while in prison and his young daughter would actually bang on the glass and wanted to get in to hug her dad and didn't understand why she couldn't. Timothy was offered a plea deal if he went to trial and if he pled guilty, he would be sentenced to two counts of second-degree murder and given two life sentences instead of death, but he refused to take this and he said he was completely innocent. The trial would begin and everyone wanted to be in the courtroom. This time, Timothy walked in, walking straight up and standing tall to his seat. The defense claimed that the physical evidence found at the Eastburn home had nothing to connect to Timothy, but the prosecution claimed that when Timothy admitted to dropping off his wife and daughter that night of the murder and going to see his ex-girlfriend, they theorized he was going to look for sex from someone other than his wife. And when his ex-girlfriend declined, he decided to go to the Eastburn home while it was still fresh in his mind after adopting Dixie from there. He knew that Katie was a beautiful woman who was home without her husband, and they theorized that Timothy tried to make a move on her, and she declined, and he got angry because it was his second woman in a row who didn't want to sleep with him, and so he got angry enough to kill her. And that possibly the children could have been witnesses, and that's why he killed them too. An entire slideshow of crime scene photos was shown to the courtroom for over an hour, and witness Patrick Combe was brought in to say that it was Timothy Hennis at the Eastburn home that early morning on Friday. But Timothy's own defense lawyers wouldn't allow him to testify because they believed he had a bad attitude and a short fuse, and he would be set off by the prosecution's questions. That he would come over the stand and try to fight them, so they told him he couldn't. The jury deliberated for the next 10 hours and returned with a verdict of guilty of three counts of first degree murder and one count of sexual assault, and he was sentenced to death and put on death row at the Central Prison in North Carolina. His lawyers believed he was innocent, but that no longer mattered. The Eastburn family had gotten justice, or had they? See, Gary Eastburn believed that they had the right man behind bars, but Timothy's wife 
felt completely opposite. But it would be Gary whose feelings would be in question when the news broke that Timothy had received a letter in prison. This letter had also been sent to investigators because what was inside would be a confession. A confession from someone who wasn't the man on death row. This letter said, Dear Mr. Hennis, I did the crime. I murdered the Eastburns. Sorry you're doing the time. I'll be safely out of North Carolina when you read this. Thanks, Mr. X. It had also been sent the same day that Timothy had been sentenced to death. Some believe this was simply a prank or worse that Timothy had put someone up to this to make it seem like he was innocent, but truly it didn't matter either way. This Mr. X couldn't be located and he had said nothing to prove that he was the real killer. He didn't know something more about the crime scene that had never been released. He didn't know a specific murder weapon. He didn't know more about what happened that night or why he killed the family. It was simply a few words that could be a plea for for attention, yet this fueled Timothy's lawyers to look for another way to appeal his case. And that's when they took it to the North Carolina Supreme Court. And two years after he was put on death row, it was said that he deserved a retrial. Now, his lawyers argued that the jury had been shown over an hour of graphic crime scene photos that swayed the jury's votes. And for the first time in North Carolina, a prisoner on death row was given a new trial. Four years after the murders, Timothy was back in a courtroom. This time, the star witness Patrick Cohn was the main focus of the defense. They were on a mission to destroy his credibility. They claimed that he had a criminal record that continued between the first and the second trial, and that when he had been arrested during that time, he had allegedly told an officer that he needed to talk to the DA because he was a valuable man due to these cases. Now, they also claimed that Patrick had said it was a fair night, and yet a meteorologist had come forward saying it had been overcast. Then they attacked the witness who had seen Timothy at the ATM. The defense said that at first she said she didn't see Timothy, but then she changed her story. Also that her transaction happened about three and a half minutes after Timothy's. And the lawyers actually had the jury sit in silence for three and a half minutes to show just how long that was. And then it would be a really long time to have been standing there waiting for the ATM to open up. And so their theory was that she hadn't actually seen him at all. He was gone before she even got there. The defense also brought their own witness who was a male lady in the area. She claimed she had seen a short white man with stringy long hair around the Eastburn home, driving a light colored van around this time. They also brought in a teenager named John Rapau who lived near the Eastburns and was jogging that night that Patrick Cohn had seen a man. It was said that he resembled Timothy greatly and he also went jogging wearing a beanie and a members only jacket that could have been what Patrick saw that night. It was allegedly found that after investigators found that this man, this jogger, could have been the person Patrick saw, they actually took his jacket and they put it in a police car and they told him to go away so the investigation didn't get confusing. They also brought in Timothy's members only jacket that was found at the dry cleaners to show that it had zero blood stains and they also showed a test under luminol that appeared to have no blood stains on it even after cleaning. They also had brought in the remains of what was burnt in Timothy's family barrel at his home and nothing pointed to evidence. Then, Timothy himself took the stand to say he had nothing to do with the murders. He was calm, he was collected, and after two days of deliberation in the second trial on April 19th of 1989, he was released. He was found not guilty, and the jurors said that there was not enough evidence to find him guilty. This shocked many, especially the surviving Eastburns, and this meant that a killer had not been found or at least hadn't been brought to justice. Timothy then appeared on the news on an interview where he said that investigators were simply trying to pin it on someone and get it out of the news. At this point, Gary took Jana to London to get away from the trial and their home and the murders that had occurred. And he still believed that Timothy was guilty. So he was getting her away from him as well. Jana, who was getting older, asked Katie's mother, so her grandmother, Grandma, I know you're not my mommy, but can I call you that? 
and so her her grandma kind of became like a motherly figure to her but Gary actually did meet a nurse while they were in London and they married soon after and she was really the only mother that Jana really remembered at that point. They were a happy little family who moved to Washington in 1998 after Gary retired. Gary kept three shoe boxes filled with photos in his closet. There was one for each of the girls because Katie had actually been wanting to create a scrapbook for each of them and so she had kept these separate boxes and Gary just couldn't get rid of them. Gary and Jana were living as normal of a life as they could. Gary did everything for her. She was his number one priority. But it still loomed in the back of his mind what happened to the rest of his family. Did Timothy do it? Was the killer someone they never investigated? Was it Mr. X? By then, Jana had grown into a lovely adult and she still had this immense guilt for not remembering anything that happened. And she also believed she had been kept alive by the universe, by God, whatever you believe, to be with her father. Over the years, many had things to say about this case, but due to a book called Innocent Victims written by Scott Wisnat, many believed that Timothy had been wrongfully convicted and almost killed on death row as an innocent man. This was even made into a movie and it swayed the public's mind and perception of this case entirely. Because in 2006, 21 years after the murders, Gary received a call from a detective in Fayetteville. He was told to sit down before the conversation could continue, and it was revealed to him that new evidence had been found in the murder of his family. You see, if you remember, investigators had gotten a sperm sample from Katie, and now they had technology to test this. They had the results of the man that they had been searching for for over 20 years, and his name was Timothy Hennis. That's right, the man they had released a man who had been free to do whatever he wanted for the last two decades, and now they needed to find him. It turned out that Timothy went back into the army as a staff sergeant. He had received awards and promotions, and he also had a son, and he eventually retired and became more involved with the children's activities while also working at a waste treatment plant. His family also lived only 30 minutes away from Gary and Jana, in Washington. Somehow he was only 30 minutes away from where they had moved years later. It appeared to many that was not a coincidence. He was located, but he couldn't be arrested for murder. He had already been tried and found not guilty. Due to double jeopardy, he was untouchable. Or was he? You see, there was also a dual sovereignty doctrine, meaning that since Timothy was a soldier at the time of the murders, there was a uniform code of military justice where he would be court-martialed and tried in military court. On September 26th of 2006, he was forced back into active duty. Timothy appealed this four times, which was all denied, and then four years later, in 2010, Timothy sat in his third trial, but this time the jury was made up of military officers. The defense claimed that the DNA of the sperm sample had been tampered with and that Timothy had sex with Katie when he picked up the dog, but it was consensual and it had nothing to do with the murders. The lawyers said that this was something all military wives did while their husbands were away. Timothy's daughter then actually testified that her father was her hero and his cousin said that he was always the one to take care of young kids and make sure they were safe. He was a good man. Yet Jana Eastburn also testified that he had robbed half of her family and her life. She was in tears when she said, I wish I had my sisters and my mom. I felt sad and alone. I didn't have anyone to look up to. It makes me feel bad and guilty. I don't have that feeling for them. Then Gary Eastburn said, I can't describe the pain, the sense of loss. I was just a basket case, really. It was my failure as a father. Were they looking for dad? I feel bad. When they needed me most, I wasn't there. I've missed their lives. I'm really bitter about that. Nobody has a right. Jurors were said to be incredibly emotional and the entire courtroom was in tears, but Timothy was then found guilty and sentenced to death for the second time. He was placed in the United States Disciplinary at Brax at Fourth Leavenworth, Kansas. And Gary was interviewed outside of the courthouse and he said that he was happy, but he hopes that he's not coming across as gloating because he is just happy that justice is served. He said that he saw Timothy's sister-in-law crying outside and he told her he was sorry for her pain 
and that he doesn't dislike Timothy's relatives because he relates to the pain they're feeling. Gary also said that he's more than aware that Timothy will probably remain in jail until he dies due to the last military execution happening in 1961, but he's also perfectly happy as long as Timothy stays there. However, the next year, a retrial was in question once again, I know. This time it was because a lab worker named Brenda Dew, who testified at this third trial, was under investigation for misleading reports in other cases. And thankfully, this retrial was denied, as well as many other appeals made by Timothy and his lawyers. But in 2019, they argued that he should have never even been court-martialed and that the Constitution prohibits this. But thankfully, by 2020, this was denied as well. So, do you believe that Timothy Hennis is guilty? Why was so much evidence not connected to Timothy? Could it have been connected to somebody else? Or did he just not leave any other evidence behind? Also, who was this Mr. X who wrote this letter? Was it possibly his wife or his family members who did it for him? How did Timothy murder an entire family and not ever commit another crime? Or did he and we don't know about it? Was this a crime of passion or an accident that he killed Katie and then he covered it up by murdering the witnesses who were her children? Or did Timothy go into her home full of anger and ready to kill? Or was this someone else entirely? Someone we don't even know about? Someone who has been free? Personally, I do believe that Timothy is guilty of these murders, but I just think that it's awful that for 20 years he got to live his life and possibly follow the survivors to where they were living, possibly stalking them, possibly knowing their every move and they had no idea. And all the while, he could have still been in prison where he was first sentenced to be. But instead, it took 20 years to solve a case that could have been solved right away. It's infuriating, but it's one of the most interesting cases I have ever researched. And so I hope you learned a little bit about Katie, about Aaron, about Kara, and about the Eastburn family. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay?